Hey, fellow Mathers, before we get into this episode, we want to share with you how you can get access to free content, professional learning that will keep your students engaged and doing the math that matters. Get ready to go to this link, mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. That's right. Registration is open for the free Math is Figure Outable challenge that's starting May 15th and runs to the 17th at 7 p.m. Central. We're going to have three nights jam-packed with learning and routines that you can take straight to your classroom. In these challenges, we have a great time. We do some math, talk about classroom experiences, give away super cool bonuses and prizes. You won't just walk away with routines that are naturally engaging and encourage your students to think mathematically. You'll also have a chance to win over 6 k worth in prizes, including a few virtual PD sessions for your school. I'll be joined by my wonderful co-host, Kim, and special guest, Jenna Laib. You can register at mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge for a fantastic learning experience. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Now on to the show. Hey, fellow mathematicians. Welcome to the podcast where math is figure outable. I'm Pam. And I'm Kim. And you found a place where math is not about memorizing and mimicking, waiting to be told or shown what to do. But y'all, it's about making sense of problems, noticing patterns, and reasoning using mathematical relationships. We can mentor mathematicians as we co-create meaning together. Not only are algorithms not particularly helpful in teaching mathematics, but rotely repeating steps actually keep students from being the mathematicians they can be. So... Podcast listeners, did you hear our first math strat chat edition last week? Huh? Yeah. Huh? Woo! Okay, so Kim and I are having a blast doing uh, those. Yeah. We just take the math strat chat question that comes out that week, and we hope you all solve it and uh, uh, post your solution, chat about other uh, people's strategies, mm -hmm. and then pop on and listen to the second Math is Forgettable podcast of the week where we share each other's strategy. So Kim will solve yeah. it and share what she's thinking about. I'll solve it, share what I'm thinking about. Double the fun. The Math is Forgettable podcast just doubled. Bam. Yep. Dun, dun, yeah, dun. super cool. So make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss those too. Absolutely. So if you yep. missed it, there's your clue to go click that button, subscribe to the podcast so you'll get the notifications when those come out as well. Totally fun. Very fun. So last week we answered Amanda's question and talked about how we think that there are very specific major strategies that everyone should own for each operation, but that there's some other cool strategies as well, even ones that we use, but they're just not the most important ones. So in this episode, we're going to answer some more questions or comments that we receive from people who have tuned in. And actually, Pam, the first place that I went to look for some questions and comments was our um, teacher Facebook group. Yeah. The, yeah, yes. it's a really great place for some conversation. Teachers leave their their thoughts, their questions, and then, you know, we, you and I go in there and we leave some thoughts and we get some conversation going with other teachers who are also trying to build numeracy and their students. Yeah, the, so if you're interested in in conversation with other Math is Figure Outable teachers, join mm -hmm. the Math is Figure Outable teacher Facebook group. Love yeah. to have you there. Yep. So in that group, Jessica said, Teaching kids in a math is figure outable way in fourth grade after they've been taught in a sit and get mimic the teacher way since kindergarten. That was a, that was a struggle. That was a like, oh, this is what I'm dealing with right now. Totally. And Carolyn said, how do you help middle school kids who are comfortable with algorithms to do real math? If they've been taught the traditional way all along, it's really hard for them to switch. And boy, do I appreciate that as a former yeah. high school teacher and a university instructor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just get them where they've been in it longer, right? Like they've yeah. just been in this uh, place where math is about rote, uh, rotely repeating steps and not thinking yeah. and reasoning. Yeah. Remember the, the story I tell some, sometimes, Kim? Um, have I told that on the podcast? I'm going to retell it. So okay. I, if I haven't, I'm saying it again. We were doing some videoing. I think I have, but I'll say it again. We've, we've been doing some videoing in um, classrooms where we go in and we teach problem strings with students. We video those. We put those in our problem string hub in Journey, which is our online implementation support system. And in that problem string hub, you can go watch these videos. And But when we when we shoot those videos, Kim taught me this. Very, very wise, Kim. You always <laughs> go in the day before and well, you have kids... Yeah 
create the name tense so you can say their names correctly. Names are important. Totally agree. Um, and you do a short problem string with them. So they kind of get a feel for what's going to happen. And then you go back the next day with the camera crew and then we shoot everything. So, so wish the cameras were this first day because it's a group of seniors. So 12th grade students, fairly successful 12th grade students. They've made it to this uh, specific class in Texas. So they had to have gotten uh, decent grades um, before that in, in classes. They're in this class, uh, 12th grade students. I do this problem string. I'm halfway through it. It's not really a time for kids to ask questions, but this kid right in the middle of the room raises his hand, has this look on his face like, what? And he raises his hand. I'm like, not really a time to ask a question, but okay. Yes. Yes. What do you got? And he goes, it's almost, it's almost like you want us to use what we know to solve the problem. Mm -hmm. And every other kid in the room was like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm I in the front story. like cracking up like, ah, oh, yeah. Part of the funny story for that is it was actually my daughter's senior class. Mm -hmm. So she was sitting in the front of the class and she looked at me and just was like, <clears throat> because uh, if you've listened to anything on the podcast, you know, my daughter is very figure she uh, m she absolutely figures out math um super mathematician but she doesn't memorize math well at all so she's always figured it all out so she's in this classroom where she's been figuring it out and so when he's like it's almost it's almost like you want us to use what we know to solve the problem she's just like yeah like you could have been yeah. all along anyway it was great That's so cool. as you read these comments from teachers who are in these places where wherever they are the students have come up to them, the students they have now, have been in kind of a fake math atmosphere. They've been in a mimic me, um, I'll do it, then we'll do it, and then you'll do it kind of a perspective where they're mimicking the teacher. It is difficult then. Well, like, what do we do? What are some hints? What are some thoughts about that? So those were great. Thanks. When you were reading those, Kim, it made me think about a tweet that had come out recently. I think that's what it was. Is that where I heard from Tad? where Tad Watanabe, great guy, um, he's a professor, and uh, he will often ping us uh, back after a podcast episode. We super appreciate the fact that he listens. He's very thoughtful, love his pushback, his really unique perspective. He uh, was raised in Japan uh, and, and uh, spoke Japanese as his native language. I hope I'm getting all this right, Tad. And is now in the United States and has, uh, from that, has a very unique perspective and shares a lot of really interesting things. So Tad said, I noticed that you do a lot of like sort of, and these are my words, but like naked number problems. But isn't it really important to help students decide which operation to do? Mm. So Tad, correct me if I'm wrong, but what I hear implicit in that question is, sure, sure, we can, it's important to help kids do computation. Yes, it's important to help kids, you know, like understand and feel and have numeracy and all. But, but Pam, there are teachers out there that are telling us that one of their major sticking points, one of their major pain points is how to help students know when they read a word problem, which operation to do. So Kim, would you agree that that is a, that teachers would tell us that is a yes. major pain point? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to get under that a little bit. This is not a trivial answer. This is in fact, Tad, sorry, I didn't answer you on Twitter. I, I've been thinking about it ever since you asked it. And I wanted to put some time and thought into it. And I really wanted to, to like chat with you about it. So let's chat today on the podcast. <laughs> so how are these, how are these related? Uh, what Jessica and Carolyn was saying about this, the difficulty of having students that have been in this mimic atmosphere. Now we want to do real math. And Tad saying, how do we help students decide in a word problem, which operation to choose? If I may, if students have been in that situation that Jessica and Carolyn just described, where math is about rote memorizing, it's about mimicking the teacher, and they get to a word problem. In that moment, they have not been in thinking land. They have not been reasoning using relationships. They have been rote memorizing and mimicking. When they get to a word problem, then they're bent. Their mindset is, all right, I'm supposed to like guess what's in the teacher's head this time. I'm supposed to pick from an operation, the goal of a word problem is to g pluck the numbers out of the word problem, flip a coin and choose. I just flipped a coin. That was me grabbing the, can you hear that? I don't know. Yes. That sounds like. So I'm looking at the, like, okay, it's head. So I'm going to choose this operation this time. It, it becomes this guessing game or Tad wants him to, to reason. I don't think Tad's suggesting that we should be guessing, but he's like, how do you help students reason about which operation? But I'm going to suggest that question stems from a fake math atmosphere. It stems from students 
not having been reasoning before they hit the word problem. So mm-hmm. when they hit the word problem, they're still not reasoning there. And we might try to help them reason, but because they are, haven't have not been reasoning as they've been, uh, as they've been computing, they continue to not reason well, or they try to reason, but they don't have the numerical relationships which isn't just numerical relationships. They also aren't reasoning additively or they're not Mm -hmm. reasoning multiplicatively. And and so if I give them a multiplication problem and they're reasoning additively, or for heaven's sakes, if they're using counting strategies, then how are they supposed to pick an operation? They're not, it's not going to feel like multiplication if they're not developing multiplicative reasoning. Yeah. So our goal would be to help teachers and then therefore their students understand, uh, create those mental relationships, create, like build additive reasoning mm-hmm. so that when you reach a word problem that that calls for addition or subtraction, you're reasoning additively. You have been computing in ways that use these big chunks of numbers, big jumps of numbers. So when you read a word problem, it feels like what you've been doing. It, it feels like the reasoning you've been doing to solve all the computation problems. If you have a division problem, a division word problem, and you, you read it, if you have been in an atmosphere where you've been uh, grappling with division as we've been doing problem strings and rich tasks and asking you to, div- to dive in and really grapple with these relationships, you've been developing multiplicative reasoning with multiplication and division. When you read a division problem, it's going to feel like your intuition is going to kick in to say, oh yeah, this is like what we've been doing. Look, I can chunk the numbers this way. Like it's, it's, you have to be reasoning multiplicatively in order to recognize that that is the operation that you want to use in that problem. You have to be reasoning proportionally in order to recognize that you've got ratios happening and you're going to be looking for equivalence or one of the other ratio uh, uh, proportion strategies. Mm -hmm. So the upshot is we've got to develop reasoning in order for students to then have the intuition and the wherewithal and the kinds of thinking, the sophistication in the way they're thinking in order to choose the operation. And it, and then honestly, it's really less about choosing an operation and it's more about, Ooh, how am I going to solve this problem? Mm-hmm. Like, like students that are in a thinking place where they've been developing more sophisticated mathematical reasoning as they go, don't look at a word problem and say, hmm, shoot, which operation am I supposed to do here? No, no, they, yeah. they, they don't do that. They, no. they, they're, they're figuring out the, the question. They're mm-hmm. reasoning as they read the question. Mm-hmm. Now, um, Kim, I want to ask you something. So don't let me forget to just, just mention that. I'll remember. <laughs> one other thing, one other thing I want to uh, bring up is this is why we don't uh, do, a, we, we don't have a big emphasis on uh, word problem strategies. Like, what, what <gasps> I are can't believe you said that. I was just about to say something about that. Well, say it. Go. Then I've been okay. Well, I, you know, I was going to say that if you are in a traditional situation where you feel like you have to like kind of spoon feed, this is how you do it. You're, you might also might also be somebody who feels like code words or a, a particular do these steps in a word problem is also helpful. And so and, shade. Shade these words, yes. underline those words, circle or, the numbers, or circle these particular the... words, and they mean to do multiplication. This w- word means to add. This mm-hmm. word, right? That's, those that's a very elementary mm-hmm. thing to to circle keywords, and then it the words as if the words tell you what to do. And so that that tends to be the way that traditional, very traditional teachers would solve the problem of their students struggle with word problems because they hit the thinking for the very first time, maybe. Um, and they, and they're, they're not sure what to do. And, and it's, it's blooming hard to mimic how to solve a word problem Yeah, because the word problems change. Yes. Right. Like if you've been in an atmosphere no where, say it again. And there's no symbol to tell you plus. Yeah, minus. exactly. There's no, there's no thing to mimic. If, if, mm-hmm. if you're in an atmosphere where everything you've done in math is here, when you see this symbol, you mm-hmm. write the numbers this way, line them up and then move the decimal butt cheek at the end. And, and that's what math is, is mimicking these steps. Mm-hmm. Now you get these stupid word problems. You're like, this isn't math. Mm-hmm. Like what? This isn't math. How am I supposed to think about the word? Where's the symbol? It's not lined up for me. I don't know. I, I Just tell me, just tell me the steps to do. If students say things like that, that should ping 
thing that you have that they have been in a fake math atmosphere and they haven't been reasoning the whole time. So we that's why we don't advocate all of that. So all of those uh God, help me, Kim. Co what it what are they called? The beams? No, like I can't even Yourself, think. The acronyms, acronyms. Yeah. All those acronyms that 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 suggest all of these um ways to help kids real ready, mimic. Mm -hmm. Think think about it that way. All of those acronyms, all of those step-by-step -step procedures to solve word problems are just that. They are an attempt at teachers who don't understand what mathematizing really is to say, oh, well, if math is about mimicking, we've got to come up with a step-by-step -step procedure that kids can mimic to solve word problems. That's just should be a hint that, it, again, that we're, we're stuck like heavily in fake math land when, when we do that. Kim, the thing that I wanted to uh, remember not to forget is let's say that you have a student who reads a word problem that maybe traditionally or typically uh, might be solved by subtraction. Yeah. Talk to me about that. Well, so, I mean, it depends on the situation and the problem, but we know that there are a variety of ways to solve subtraction problems, right? We, you could think of subtraction as removal, but you can also think about subtraction as finding the distance or the difference between two numbers. And so a kid might look at it and say, oh, for these numbers, I'm going to choose to find the distance and I'm going to find it as a missing add -in problem. So Absolutely. Those, those mimic these steps for subtraction might not even make sense to them. And, and the and same thing problem. could be true. Yeah. Absolutely. The same thing could be true for a quote unquote division problem. A student mm -hmm. might think of that, see that problem and vision it, feel it as a missing factor problem. Mm -hmm. And if the teacher's up there going, okay, so did you, did you choose the right operation? It should be division. And the kid's like, oh, crud, I did it wrong again. I was thinking yeah. multiplication. Oh, yeah. I'm not a math person. Okay. I guess I'll just, you know, and, and then we have that, that we continue that sense of if it doesn't follow my intuition, I'm not a math person. And so I'll just try to memorize your stuff. And now we're back in this mimicking land and, and, and students are trying to mimic that don't even feel like they can. Um, mm -hmm. We want to avoid those moments at all costs, we, yeah. uh, especially that when the student's intuition was brilliant, right? Yeah. The missing factor problem, a missing add-in problem could absolutely be the way to solve uh, a nice problem. And, and, uh, and then we don't have to worry. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Help me, Kim. How, how, finish that sentence I was on. Oh, oh gosh. Uh, well, I mean, we want kids thinking, right? And so we got to give them opportunities where their thinking is valued and where they can trust their intuition rather than just continuing to say, do these steps rotely. We want to put them in situations where their thinking is, is important, maybe in a naked number situation, so that when they come to those word problems, then they just go, oh, it's, I'm just thinking now about a situation rather than just the numbers. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nicely said. So, Tad, it's not that I don't ever work with context problems. In fact, we work with context a lot. We like to have many contexts in uh, problem strings. We like to have some major contexts in rich tasks or what Kathy Fosno calls truly problematic situations. Um, we deal with context a lot. In my work with teachers, what you might be seeing me put out a lot in social media is to help teachers develop mathematical relationships, is to help them develop their additive reasoning, help them develop their multiplicative reasoning, help them develop their proportional reasoning and their functional reasoning with the numbers so that they are thinking and reasoning mathematically so that then they can help their students think and reason mathematically. And if we all get in that vein, we don't need to spend so much time at all helping students decide, quote unquote, which operation to use. So All we, right. love, we love questions and comments, right? We're so excited yes, to be able to answer yes. those. Hey, if listeners, if you have any questions or comments, you are so welcome to send those to me at Kim at math is .com. We'd love to hear from you. Or throw them in the Math is Figureoutable Facebook teacher group yes. and we will get to them there as well. Thank you so much for joining us on this podcast. Thanks for tuning in and teaching more and more real math. To find out more about the Math is Figureoutable movement, visit mathisfigureoutable.com. Let's keep spreading the word that math is figureoutable. Thank you for listening and making math more figureoutable. To learn even more, make sure you register for our free challenge at mathisfigureoutable.com challenge. 
You are not going to want to miss the evenings of May 15th through 17th, starting at 7 p.m. Central. Math teaching, math teaching, go register now. That's mathisfigureoutable.com slash challenge. Join us to make math more and more figure outable. And if you can't join live, register and we'll send you access to the recordings. We'll see you there.